Dear colleagues, this is my presentation for the Modern Trends in Health Economics, Healthcare and Technologies 2019 in Venice in May 2019. During the years 2009 and 2010, I participated and led the Healthcare Committee uh, of the Government of the Republic of Macedonia. 150 volunteers from all walks of life, professors, activists, non-government organizations, experts um, and representatives of the public, we put together a series of recommendations uh, on how to overhaul, uh, reconstruct and reform the healthcare system in the Republic of Macedonia under the tutelage of Minister Buyar Osmani, who was Minister of Health um, at the time and a medical doctor. The underlying values that dictated our approach to healthcare reform were formulated as follows. We realized that there are many health systems and models as there are countries. This is because healthcare is a public good and thus reflects the social and cultural values of the societies that design and adopt these systems. Let's start with social and cultural values. We should distinguish social and cultural values from economic and operational values. Efficiency, for instance, is an economic operational value, not a social cultural one. Equity, though often considered to be an economic criterion, is actually a normative social cultural value whose pursuit often comes at a steep economic price and is largely non-efficient. Health systems can be categorized according to which class of values they emphasize. The American United States health system is geared to satisfy economic operational requirements, while European health systems, including the NHS in the United Kingdom, place a premium on social cultural ones. In this video presentation and paper, I deal with three social cultural constraints, solidarity, equity versus inequity, and progressivity versus regressivity. And that includes the issue of redistribution. There are many other social cultural values, obviously, and I do not cover them here. There's fairness, there's dignity, there's choice, and many others. But I do provide a discussion of the concept of public good in current healthcare. Let's start with social solidarity. Social solidarity is both vertical and horizontal, and both contemporaneous and intergenerational. Members of the same society ought to strive to share the burdens of the sick, the young, the poor, the weak, and the disenfranchised. This is usually done by transferring economic resources among population groups and by promoting fairness. At the same time, people should feel morally obliged to provide aid and succor to their peers and relatives, neighbors, colleagues, compatriots and friends. And they should do that by encouraging social cohesion and sharing of responsibility, their responsibilities, for example, within the nuclear or extended family. Such attitudes are not generational. They don't depend on when you were born. They cut uh, across generations so that the current generation is held responsible and answerable to future generations for their well-being and the reasonable fulfillment of their needs. And so this solidarity across time is at the foundation of most modern pension systems, for example. Some health systems are explicitly founded on social solidarity, others implicitly so. However, there are health systems which partly or altogether eschew social solidarity as a defining principle or as a determinant. Health systems of the first type, the ones that espouse solidarity, are usually universal, uniform and comprehensive. They rely on tax revenues or a social insurance scheme or a combination of both. Health systems of the second type depend on private insurance. They are not universal and are more diverse in the types of medical coverage offered. Albeit, this diversity comes with increased transaction costs, as we all know. Introducing means testing 
asking the rich to pay additional or higher user fees for, in for insurance, deductibles, or participation. So, means testing does not affect social solidarity. On the contrary, in my view, taxing the rich to pay for the poor is the very essence of a solidary state. Similarly, introducing safety nets, such as voucher systems, is also a solidary act. Whether such an approach is ideal from the economic point of view is outside the scope of this paper and my arguments. Let's tackle the second social cultural criterion that I've mentioned, and that is equity. There are three types of equity. There is equity of financing, affordability. Can the poor, the unemployed, the homeless, the old, the young, the weak, the chronically sick and the disenfranchised, can they afford the healthcare offer? That healthcare is an offer doesn't mean it's affordable or accessible. Are the expenses that they have to incur catastrophic? Do certain expenditures, for instance, user fees or participation in the cost of medication, do these user fees deter utilization or pre prevent it altogether? Do the payments reflect one's income or wealth? Are they fair? The second type of equity is equity of utilization, accessibility, and that is comprised of two components. Vertical equity, can everyone access healthcare services and facilities and make use of them easily and equitably on the same terms and conditions, regardless of income? And this type of equity correlates with the progressivity of the health system, as I will discuss a bit later. And then there's horizontal equity. Horizontal equity is the extent to which people with identical incomes are treated similarly. This type of equity correlates with the redistributive aspects of the health system. And I will discuss that as well a bit later. Finally, there's equity of quality. Is the level of quality healthcare provided in all regions of the country in rural versus urban, urban settings, to the poor and to the rich, is the quality uniform? Is it the same? Medical savings accounts adversely affect equity, for example, because they skew economic incentives and the allocation of healthcare resources towards rich and men. Women and the poor cannot save as much and have greater healthcare needs, actually. User fees may actually increase equity under certain conditions, Counterintuitively. For example, if the income they generate is targeted at the poor and the chronically ill, then they are a kind of user fees are a kind of redistributive mechanism. If user fees, um, if poor and chronically ill are exempted from paying user fees, if the level of funding from other sources, taxes, contributions, is not reduced because of user fees, or in all these cases, user fees actually have been shown to increase equity. What about the devolution of healthcare services? These may create inequity, as rich municipalities are able to spend more on healthcare than poorer ones. The government should create an equalization fund or use uh, general tax revenue to transfer resources from wealthier to more destitute regions. Pooling of funds among regional or competing funds guarantees more equity. Regional health insurance funds increase inequity as they are faced with the same problems that I described uh, under devolution. Poorer regions cannot compete with richer regions on purchasing and, the, and provision of healthcare, period. Never mind what is the financing or the funding mechanism used. Governments has to, have to recognize this. Governments have to increase equity by reallocating resources from poor to rich. Social health insurance and tax-based healthcare financing maintain the same level of equity of financing. Negative co-payments, no claim bonuses, income caps or ceilings on contributions, the inclusion of dependents in the coverage at no additional cost, and the extent of cost sharing, all these determine how equitable and progressive the social insurance scheme is. Risk-rated premiums decrease equity as they discriminate against the already ill and may deter them from seeking care altogether. On the other hand, exemptions granted to specific population groups and not based on income increase equity. The sick and the old may gain better access to quality health care than other equally deserving beneficiaries. And then there's risk-adjusted uh, DRG, capitalized, uh, capitation systems, and they, are con they enhance, actually, vertical equity. Informal payments 
bribes and other forms, dramatically decrease equity because access is restricted to those who can afford to pay and because payment terms and levels are arbitrary, they are changeable. Certain services and goods are rendered unaffordable by bribes and corruption. Public, more equitable services suffer and there's a lack of regulation which creates variable quality of healthcare, fiscal irresponsibility and lack of fairness. Another um, social cultural criterion that I've mentioned is progressivity and redistribution. Though progressivity and redistribution are often conflated with equity, these are two separate issues. We can imagine a progressive system of health funding which is not equitable. We can consider the reverse as well. We say that healthcare funding is progressive when rich people pay more as a proportion of their income than poorer folk. The system is proportional when both rich and poor use up the same proportion of their disposable income to defray healthcare costs. And it is regressive when poor people pay a higher portion of their income than the affluent to consume healthcare goods and services. So progressivity largely determines whether there is a redistribution of resources from the rich to the government, not necessarily to the poorer segments of the population, but to the government. How extensive and ubiquitous the redistribution from the government to the poor uh, is depends on how involved the state is in the economy. In other words, there's one redistribution from, poor to gov uh, from rich to government and then another redistribution from government to poor. It depends on the tax burden, the incidence of public spending, and on the absolute level of tax revenue, among other factors. Tax-funded healthcare is always progressive, assuming that most of the tax revenue is generated from, the, from direct ta taxes, not from consumption or indirect taxes, which are regressive. It is less progressive than social health insurance when indirect taxes constitute a major source of budget revenue and the informal sector that does not pay taxes is quite large. Earmarked, seen or hypothecated taxes, taxes on alcohol, tobacco, motor vehicles and medicines, all these taxes are regressive, though their regressivity is intentional as they are intended to deter consumption, of course. Coming back to social health insurance, it is generally less progressive than the tax base system. That's against our intuition. Because social health insurance does not tax income from interest, from rent, from capital gains, and from non-wage types of income. This is especially true when there is an income ceiling about which contributions are not levied, when there are no exemptions for low-income groups, and when the rates are uniform, regardless of the size of the wages they are levied on. Still, Social health insurance is more redistributive, redistributive than private insurance because social health insurance charges uniform or community rates. It ensures dependence at no extra cost and the length and extent of healthcare goods and services provided is not related to previous or cumulative contributions. Social healthcare insurance is also caters to the needs of the old, so it's a form of intergenerational redistribution. Still, this type of redistribution has negative economic effects, which are outside the scope of my paper. The introduction of private health insurance to compete with the statutory health insurance fund is neutral as far as progressivity goes. Only where private insurers, insurance has supplanted social insurance as the main source of funding, only then do we have regressivity increasing markedly. Risk-rated premiums, however, are always regressive. Medical savings account have no regressive or progressive effect as they do not redistribute income at all. All types of savings are neutral as far as progressivity and regressivity go. But user fees are highly regressive regardless of any supplementary policy measures such as exemption. Only the introductions of means testing can reduce the regressivity of user fees. Informal payments, bribes, corruption, are highly regressive as the poor are asked to pay a higher proportion of their income or assets, even when they are charged less than rich patients. Tax deductibility of healthcare expenses is highly regressive as well, because people with higher income tax rates receive a higher deduction effectively. These are the overall uh, cultural social determinants and criteria when we consider to design or redesign healthcare systems. Thank you for listening and I wish you all a wonderful conference with many new things to learn, models to compare 
and cultural, uh, intercultural interaction. Have a good time and thank you again.